But a lot, but people both in the church and outside of the church have a lot of questions. And so again, this was not anything that was on my radar, so this was put together pretty quickly uh, in response to what I believe and what Anita and I believe was a calling and a directive from the Lord to do this. So we are here today, you are here today, uh, because of the Lord's doing, not because of anything we had planned or purposed. Uh, this is of God. So we're going to give him all the glory. A couple of things as we get started, and we will open in prayer. Uh, it would be impossible to exhaust all of the resources and experts that are involved in this accumulation of things that we're going to be talking about over the next uh, several months, Lord willing. Uh, some of the notable ones, Dave Hunt, uh, Sir Robert Anderson, uh, Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, Chuck Missler, the Conania Institute Christian Think Tank, on and on, Hal Lindsey, hundreds and hundreds of people, of the collective work of the anointed of the Holy Spirit among men through hundreds of years is basically what is going to be presented this week and the weeks to come. Very little of this is original to me or mine or Anita's. We want to give glory where it is. And there's, there's lots of people. Uh, that, uh, that you would want to honor uh, and uh, attribute to. Ultimately, though, we're here to attribute to the Holy Spirit because we believe that all of this is an, in a, is an encompassed work of the Holy Spirit, and we're very excited to present it to you. Some of the questions are, um, it, are we entering the end times? Uh, people talk about the rapture. The rapture is a big topic. Uh, is, is the rapture a thing? Is it pre-trib? Is it post-trib? Is it biblical? A lot of questions. Uh, concerning these issues. What's the day of the Lord? What? Who is this Antichrist? You, you've heard your whole lives about six. Anybody not heard 666? What is 666? The Antichrist. This mark of the beast, right? So, and, and I, I, I don't know that there's a person in America that if you said 666, didn't hear that before. So we're going to talk about that. What's the mark? There's lots of things we're going to talk about as we get into this. Ultimately, uh, this is going to be primary, a, primarily a Revelation teaching. However, before we can get into Revelation, we're going to have to do some background. Uh, and so tonight and tomorrow, we're going to be focusing on the topic of the 70th week of Daniel. And I'll ask for another show of hands. How many people know about it or have even heard about the 70th week of Daniel? So maybe half. So for some of you, this will be review. Maybe there will be some insights uh, to the rest of you. This is foundational to what we call eschatology. What's eschatology? Anybody know? The study of end time things. A simple way of saying the study of end time things. So we're calling this an end time study. We'll be primarily in the book of Revelation. But we're going to be going to Daniel primarily today and next week. Talking about the 70th week prophecy. Uh, we'll, then we'll then from there uh, take a bunny trail into uh, a few chapters in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And then ultimately we'll get into the book of Revelation. And, by, and this may shock you, but the bulk of our time in the book of Revelation is going to be addressing church business. The first two to three chapters. Uh, the, the Lord has a lot to say. In fact, Jesus Christ himself wrote seven epistles. Uh, in chapters 2 and 3 to the churches. But tonight, the foundation is uh, the 70th week of Daniel. And before we start, let's do something radical. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. But Father God, I just want to thank you, Lord. Anita and I <laughs> were... Uh, Speaking often these last couple months, praying often, and we prayed, Lord, that you would not only send those to the study, but prepare the hearts to receive what we believe, again, is your calling and your mandate upon us. And we're just trying to respond appropriately. So first and foremost, thank you <laughs> for, for sending uh, the individuals that you've sent here today. We believe 100% that we are here today by your divine appointment and by your direction. So our prayer is, is that, that we can get out of the way. Honestly, that we can get out of the way and just let you operate. I just pray that you will speak through me, that you will speak through uh, this message, that you will operate and speak through Anita. I thank you for her. She has been an unbelievable blessing uh, to this study, and I pray that you will return to her a blessing 
for her prayers and encouragement and support and all her diligence in this. And I pray for every individual here. I pray, Lord, that uh, if there's any distractions that were brought in here, Lord, that you will just remove them. I pray if there's any opposition from Satan or from the enemy, Lord, that we bind it, we cast it out. There's no place for that here. You have a mission and a purpose today, Lord. And we pray that that mission and purpose will be accomplished. We pray that you will open up our eyes and our minds and our hearts to your word that we will receive. And so we thank you, Lord, for this time. We commit this time to you. May your anointing be here. Lord, we sang about your holiness today. Hallelujah. In first service. May your holiness be here. You and you alone are holy. Have your way in this time. In the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our Master and King. Amen. 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 So a little bit of structural uh, FYIs as we get into this. Uh, this is not a Bible preaching. Like you would go into the sanctuary, the pastor you know, reads a few verses of scripture and it's a preaching. This is really a, a, an ironclad Bible teaching. Uh, it's expositional. Most of what we're going to do, we, uh, that means that we're, most of what we're doing, we're going line by line through the subject matter, breaking it down, and uh, doing the, the best of our ability as the Holy Spirit has anointed us uh, to tell you and teach you about what God's Word says. Uh, the mission is several missions. One, that you will grow in knowledge of the Word of God. As you grow in the Word of God, we're praying that the Lord will draw you closer. We serve a God that uh, desires a personal and intimate relationship with each and every one of us. So we're praying that you will grow in your personal walk with the Lord during this time. But as they said in first service, uh, they, uh, the pastors uh, referenced Ephesians 4. Ultimately, it's the mission of this small group, of the church, of all of us, to equip the saints, you guys, to do the works of ministry. So who at work, who in your family, who might you come into contact with that might have some questions about what, what's going on in today's world? The goal is to equip you with answers. Thy word is true. I guess I pulled out all these books. I need to pull this one out. The Bible. Thy word is truth. We have the truth given to us by the Lord. And so the goal is, is to teach you that truth. And that's what we're going to try to do here to the best of our ability. Now, if you're looking at the title screen here, you're going to see first and foremost that it says session 11. And that might be a little confusing. Uh, one of the things the Lord called me to do very briefly a couple years ago was to put the entire Bible on PowerPoint so that you could teach any part of the Bible at any given moment on a whim. So we're going to jump around a little bit. This would come from session 11 of my Revelation commentary. But again, the 70th week of Daniel is foundational. You will find, if you start digging into stu the studying of eschatology, that most people, if they struggle with it, it ultimately ties back to having a weak or a non-existent understanding of what we call the 70th week of Daniel. So tonight we're going to talk about the 70th week prophecy. We're going to talk specifically on the first 69 weeks. And as important as this session is, next session is that much more important. You're not going to want to miss next Sunday because that's when we're going to talk about an interval period of time and then that 70th week. That 70th week is ultimately what the Bible has an awful lot to say about Old and New, especially in the Old Testament, about a specific seven-week period that occurs um, at the end of the age before the return of the king. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the rapture. We're going to talk about the different views that people have. I'm going to be open about my views and my presuppositions. Doesn't mean I'm right. Um, I want to focus you to what I've adopted as my Bible teaching verse, Acts 17:11. It reads, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Uh, so they're talking about the Berean people. The Berean people are being praised here because they received the message or the word with openness. But they also did something else. They didn't just blindly accept it. They tested it to the word of God to see if it be so. So if you guys are here and you're listening to David Albrecht or Anita Williams speak, and you just accept what we say without testing it, that's the only way you fail this class. If there's grades. There's no grades. But if there were grades, that's how you would fail this class, is to accept what myself, anybody, what anybody says without testing it to the Word of God. 
So I'm asking you to receive with openness, but to test it with the Word of God. Don't believe anything David Albrecht says without testing it. Or, or uh, Anita Williams, or uh, don't tell Russ I said this, Russ Gump. Don't believe anything anybody tells you. You, you believe the Word of God. That is the truth. That is the truth. So I wanna, one of my, my favorite quotes comes from Edmund Spencer. And he says, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is a proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. What a quote. Uh, maybe say it a different way. Judgment or coming to a conclusion before investigation. So many of us have heard our favorite pastors speak on this issue. Many of us have heard, uh, maybe read things. And that's great, but I want to challenge you to the best of your ability, set aside anything you think you know about this topic for just a moment, for a period of time here. Come in with an open mind to receive. Test it, but come into an open mind to receive. The greatest tragedy or barrier to learning is, is believing that you already know it before you come in. Uh, so that would be my challenge to you. To the best of your ability, set aside any prejudgments or presuppositions that you might have. So I'm going to be brief here. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, tonight and next week are pretty in-depth, uh, so we're, we're going to probably take every minute available, and, and I might even cheat you a couple. Uh, but we're going to look at Daniel here today, primarily Daniel chapter 9. And I'll go brief through these first few slides, but when you look at the book of Daniel, just by way of outline, you're going to see that the first five or six chapters are more historical. Okay, So chapters 1 through 6 are historical. Uh, and then you will have, after that, more in the, in the realm of visions, chapters 7 through 12. You'll also notice in the book of Daniel, now I guess I'll just go through these real briefly. The Times of the Gentiles is chapter 7, if you're looking for a brief outline. Uh, the ram and the goat. Uh, anybody know what the ram and the goat is about, just off the top of your head? That's detailing the career of Alexander the Great. Okay, So you have the ram and the goat. Uh, what we're focusing on uh, tonight and next session is going to be the 70th week of Daniel. We'll talk about that more. Uh, and then, of course, um, that, that gives you an outline of the book of Daniel. So chronologically, just so you know, if you never knew this, Daniel is not in chronological order. It would actually go, if you're going in chronological order, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, then chapters 7 and 8, then 5, 9, 6, and then 10 through 12. That's not eschatology related. That's just a nice FYI for you guys if you're studying Daniel. By the way, that's like that in the Bible, too. Just because the Old Testament, now Genesis is the book of beginnings, but the Bible, as it's in your Bible, isn't necessarily in chronological order, so just be sensitive to that. So if I can draw your attention to the blue screen there. And by the way, we did our best. Uh, when we trialed this earlier in the week, our fonts were small. So we did blow up our fonts. I hope you guys can see everything. We were going to have handouts. That didn't work out. Uh, but we'll try to send that stuff via email to you. Uh, but that's the basic outline. The book is in two parts, historical and prophecy, and it's not in order. Okay. So before we get into chapter 9, though, I want to give you a reason why we're going to chapter 9. We're actually going to be going to chapter 9 and talking about the 70th week of Daniel because that's what Jesus actually commanded uh, some of his disciples to do when they came to him privately and asked about it. Now, some of you that were in uh, our Sunday school class were blessed with a little glimpse of this in Matthew 24 from Shane. Um, if you've been in Anita's class, I'm sure you've talked about Matthew 24. Uh, but we're going to take a look at that and see what Jesus says. But we're going to find that Jesus points. They ask three questions, and he points these disciples to Daniel 9. And that's why we're going to go to Daniel 9 to see what he's talking about. So we're in Matthew 24. By the way, uh, this account is also in Mark 13, and this account is also in, what is it? I've got to go back because it's in my notes. Luke 21, I believe. Luke 21, Mark 13, and Matthew 24. I put Luke 21 in parentheses because I don't think it's the exact same event, but I'm not going to bore you with that here today, but you can dig that out on your own. So Matthew 24. Four disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, are with Jesus, they come to him privately, and they say, ask three questions. Uh, they ask, um, and we'll get to that, but he, and I know it before even looking at the slide, tell us when these things will be, the sign of your coming, and the end of the age. Okay? 
So he's going to come to them, and we're going to look at that. That's Matthew 24, 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, by the way, the Mount of Olives, most people call this the Olivet Discourse because this discourse happened on the Mount of Olives. So as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, he, Jesus, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And from these three questions, Jesus responds in dialogue for two chapters. And we're not going to take the time to look at all that here today. Uh, but we're going to at least introduce it and make our case as to why we're going to Daniel chapter 9 to talk about this 70th week prophecy. So, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And that's important to know that in this dialogue, he's responding to three questions. So you, when, you're, when you're breaking down Matthew 24, well, which question is he addressing? You'll have some confusion if you don't do that. And again, I'm not going to do that here. You can do that on your own. But the, 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 the entire scope of Matthew 24 and even into Matthew 25 is generally tied back and referenced to these three questions. So let's move on. Jesus And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. That's Matthew 24, uh, verses 4 through 8. So I've underlined the word deceive there. Why do you think I've done that? Any thoughts, real briefly? There are no wrong answers, unless you're wrong. <laughs> we see well, well, first off, it's the first thing he says in response. And uh, if in the Bible, sometimes you take note to, and it's not really relevant here, but the law of first mention is important. So the first thing that comes out of his mouth in this question is, see you not be deceived. Um, deception is the biggest thing to be concerned about, the first thing that comes out of his mouth. Uh, so if that's the case, that should it hopefully prompt you and I to ask the question, well, how do we keep from being deceived? Any suggestions from the group? How do you keep from being deceived? Study, 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 study. Diligent study. What else? Any, any other ideas? Don't believe something just because somebody says it. Yeah, so, so, so do your homework, test it. Prayer for discernment. I'm sorry? Prayer for discernment. Prayer for discernment, yeah. yeah. The, the Word of God is just print on paper unless you're looking at it through the lens of the Holy Spirit. When you guys go before the Lord in your devotion or in your Bible study time, do you pray first? Do you invite the Holy Spirit? Do you ask to see this text through the lens of the Holy Spirit? It's going to come alive when you do. Absolutely. I'll give you one more. You need to take the whole counsel of God. One of the biggest ways people get deceived is they come out and they'll say, they'll reference one verse of Scripture, maybe pick another one over here, another one over here, and build a doctrine around it. That's all great if it measures up with the rest of the Bible. But if it doesn't, that's one of your guards of being deceived. And so you need to be careful with that, okay? But diligence is the biggest one. And I want to point out to you, not that, we, not that it's a super big deal, but many will, will point to these things as signs of the end times. And I just want to point out to you that I actually see the exact opposite here. Uh, he says, the end is not yet. So he says, deception. He says, wars and rumors and wars, that you be not troubled. He says, these will come to pass, and he says, the end is not yet. So just because there's wars and rumors and wars and deception doesn't necessarily mean these are, these are signs of the end times. These things will happen. We believe they will grow in frequency, but they're not necessarily signs of the end times. They've really always been. Now they're going to grow in intensity. Now he does give signs in this dialogue. We're not going to spend a ton of time on that tonight, but those really aren't signs. They're sorrows. Some call them sorrows. Anybody up here ever been uh, pregnant? I can't raise my hand. <laughs> Do, do they grow in intensity yes. as you get closer? That, that, you know, you've heard pastors say that. That's probably accurate and relevant. As you get closer, these things might grow in intensity and frequency. Uh, but these aren't signs. So that's what he says. 
Oops. New computer, bear with me. So I'm going to skip ahead to, to 24, 15, and 16. Uh, so he, he goes on, and then we get to Matthew 24, 15, and, he's, and this is Jesus. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Ah, abomination of desolation. We're going to talk about that. That's very important. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Oh, so we have a specific abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Did you guys just hear what I just said there? What did I say? Whoso readeth, let him understand. Did he say just the Jews? Did he say just the church? Did he say just pastors and teachers? No. Whosoever readeth. That's why we're here today. Because I believe, we believe, that God wants whosoever to hear this to understand. So he's talking about an abomination of desolation. We'll talk about what that is and what that means. He's talking about it in the holy place. Is there a holy place right now in Israel? Is there a, are there sacrifices? Is there a temple? No. Okay, that's, that's going to be relevant. We'll talk about that more. But when you see future tense... He's talking about an abomination of desolation that's going to happen in the future, according to Daniel, let them understand. And then he goes on to say, then let, then let them with their in, which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Um, are we in Judea? He's talking about a specific place, right? Okay. Talking about the Jews, right? Daryl. Is that Daryl? I heard somebody over there. Bobby. Okay. So he points to Daniel 9. And, and so when you dig that out, he's actually talking about, it turns out, uh, something that Daniel talks about in Daniel 9. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, by the way, there is a school of thought out there uh, that would suggest that Daniel didn't write Daniel. You get all sorts of stuff like that. You have, you have some that say, well, Isaiah didn't write all of Isaiah. There's two Isaiah authors or three Isaiah authors. Jesus does us a huge service here and saves you and I hundreds of hours of Boring, boring library research. <laughs> Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. I view that as Daniel attributing, or Jesus attributing the writings of Daniel to Daniel. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, and you believe in Jesus Christ, and we all believe in Jesus Christ, we shouldn't have any problems with who the author of Daniel is. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, do me a favor. Don't worry about the authorship of Daniel. You've got much bigger problems, right? Amen. You've got much bigger problems than the authorship of Daniel. Uh, so we'll move on there with that. But no, again, notice the Jewishness. Those in the mountains of Judea flee. And we'll look at, the, at, at the, that more as we go. Judea. Uh, he goes on to say, um, uh, uh, let pray that it not be on the Sabbath day. Would that matter to you and I, really? <laughs> to an Orthodox Jew, it would, right? If you were trying to get out of town and get out of town quick, if you were an Orthodox Jew and it happened on the Sabbath, that would create some problems mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Okay? So and we'll, just see, we'll just pick up where he left off. Jesus says, Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Get that? You get out of town and you get out now. When you see this abomination of desolation in the holy place, you get out. No time to waste. Neither let him which is in the fields return back to take his clothes. Big mistake. Don't go back. And woe unto them which are with child. Why would that be a problem? Anybody had an infant trying to go somewhere? It slows you up, right? Mm -hmm. And to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? How many people just heard that or read that believe that that's going to happen someday? Yeah. Most of us would believe that. Yeah. But yet, despite that, it says, pray ye. What do you make of that? Any thoughts? If it's going to happen, why does he say pray? Because he doesn't. Well, Christ might know, but we don't know. Only the Father knows. That's right. Nobody knows the day or the hour right. of the Lord's return. <laughs> I see, it doesn't mean I'm right. Test it for yourself. But this is going to happen just as God said it would happen. But it's interesting that their prayers, maybe our prayers or their prayers, can influence when it happens and how it happens for them. Apparently from this verse, it could happen in summer. Apparently from this verse, it can happen in the spring or the fall. 
And apparently it could happen on days one through six, or it could happen on day seven. It's going to happen, but it looks like prayer can impact how it happens for these people, or for you and I. I don't think it's for you and I. I'm not going to get into that here. He's, again, it's very Jewish in nature. Pray that it neither happen on the Sabbath day. This is in Judea, and he's talking about, it's very, it's very Jewish in nature, okay? But I find that very interesting. We'll move on. For then shall be great tribulation. Anybody ever heard that term in a church somewhere? Great tribulation. Okay? That's a good reference as to why we call it the great tribulation. For then there shall be great... How long is the great tribulation? Three and a half. Three and a half years. That's what we're going to talk about. Precision matters. There is a seven year period of time. But the great tribulation is the last three and a half years of that seven years. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go through all that when we get there. But he says, There shall be great tribulation such as such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall there be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. I got an idea about this verse. It doesn't mean I'm right. I view that verse as a technology verse. <coughs> Lest those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. If you read that during the time of the Civil War, that might not mean as much to you as now. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of deaths and damage was done with, with uh, um, primitive weapons. But look at what we can do now. Look at what we can do now. By the way, anybody know the date of the, the atomic bomb in Japan? Anybody have that date on their mind? Yesterday. When? Was it yesterday? In Japan, uh, uh, in World War II. 75 years yeah, ago yeah, yesterday. 75 years ago yesterday. Yeah. Okay, 75 years ago yesterday. That was 75 years ago. So my question is, what's in the toy chest now? <laughs> what's in the toy chest now? Well, we know we spend billions on biological weapons. I'm not going to get into that here tonight. But we, 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 we have billions spent on biological warfare. I'm a, I have to assume that we have stuff in the chest that makes that original bomb look like a firecracker. Yeah. Definitely. What damage can we do? What is in Pandora's box waiting to be unleashed? Except those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay. So that's a flavor of Matthew 24, but we see he talks specifically when he's answering their questions about this abomination of desolation that Daniel the prophet talked about. So that really, ref I'll save you the time of going through all 12 chapters or whatever, that takes us to Daniel chapter 9. And, and we're going to talk about the 70th week prophecy. Again, if you've talked with people that have, or, or listened to people that have taught on eschatology, and, and it looks like it's clumsy or there's confusion, um, it most of the time comes back to a lack of understanding or an improper understanding of this. This is foundational. If we're going to dump, jump into Revelation, we need to understand what this is about. And so that's why we're going to take two sessions right out the gate to do just that. Okay? So the original Hebrew, which we call the Tanakh, was really assembled in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, this was several centuries before the Gospel period. So when you get to the third century before Christ, if you were a Jew... You probably did not know much Hebrew. You would have spoke Greek. Greek was the enforced language under Alexander the Great and the following people after him. So Latin became the official language of the Roman Empire, but even then, Greek was prom prominently used in Rome, okay? So if you were a Jew, this would be very frustrating for you. Um, you would probably know Hebrew the way a Catholic might know Latin. Enough to be dangerous, but not really fluent in it, okay? So it's for this reason that the Jewish community, again, several centuries before Jesus Christ, came together, and a work was created, what we call the Septuagint translation. Anybody ever heard of that? Now, if you're in my class, you should be raising your hands, because I mention it from time to time. But uh, the Septuagint translated, translation was created. Why Septuagint? Well, because it was 70 guys that got together. Now, if you dig into that, some will say 69, some will say 71. Uh, let's just put that aside and say 70 of the brightest Hebrew people came together and created the Septuagint translation, okay? Septuagint is just a fancy word for 70. So why do you say that? You're off topic, David. Well, that's important to know because from an 
authentication standpoint, we need to recognize a couple things, actually. This is just for general study, uh, knowledge for general study. Most of the time in the New Testament, when Jesus, Peter, and Paul are quoting, they're not quoting from the Old Testament Hebrew. They're quoting from the New Testament Greek. That's called the Septuagint. Why is that important to us? First and foremost, it authenticates that language. If, G if it's good enough for Jesus to quote and Paul to quote from, it's good enough, good enough for us to authenticate the word of God, number one. Okay? And that's very, very important. And it is indeed a blessing. Uh, I also want to point it out because that translation took 15 <coughs> years uh, of these guys putting it together. They very diligently did it. Uh, and it's the most common common translation in the New Testament to the Old Testament Greek. So Pastor Tom actually today quoted from Luke chapter 4. Okay? And Luke chapter 4, he's referencing Isaiah 61. Okay? Um, he's he's look, if, if you go in your New Testament and read it and go to your Old Testament in the English, it may not read exactly the same. There's a reason for that. Because he's quoting from the Old Testament Greek not the Old Testament Hebrew. So sometimes you'll see subtleties. It might be intended to be an exact quote, but the New Testament speaker is quoting from a different language. So that's why I want you to note that. But the other point is, the uh, Mesoretic text is the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, and this actually came later than the Greek translation. Okay? So I, I say that because the Greek translation was actually translated before this Mesoretic text of the Hebrew, uh, that, that came later. So it's a very, very appropriate translation, and it's very, very relevant for our, our time here. Jesus is quoting from Daniel 9 that was written hundreds of years before his time that was translated in Greek before Jesus came. Um, I just say that because if, if somebody was to be a skeptic and try to say, well, Jesus messed around with this, or there was tampering with this, it would have been very, very tough to do. It's very, very tough to do. Um, and if you follow that through, fine. If not, not a super big deal. So Daniel chapter 9, we're going to read, which we'll start at the beginning. Verses 1 through 19 is what we call Daniel's prayer. Okay? Uh, by the way, there's three primary prayers uh, in the Bible historically. Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, and Daniel 9. If you ever want to dig those out, we're not going to do that here. But the first 19 verses are Daniel's prayer. Verses 20 through 23 is his prayer interrupted. This is a lot of times commonly known as the interrupted prayer of Daniel. By the way, I just got to ask, just in case somebody would say yes, has anybody prayed in their lifetime and had Gabriel show up? I just have to know. I, I, actually, I would like you to come up here and I want to sit down if that's the case. Um, but um, boy, that, that, that would be exciting, maybe scary. I don't know. That would be pretty intense. But that's going to happen here in Daniel 9. And then when Daniel inter or when Gabriel interrupts Daniel, uh, we're going to get the 70th week prophecy that's going to be very uh, relevant. That's verses 24 through 27. Our objective tonight is verses 24 and 25. 24 will give us the scope of the entire prophecy. 25 will give us 69 of those 70 weeks. It's going to make more sense when we get in. But we're going to get a part of the prophecy today and the rest of it next time. You don't want to miss next time. If you, When we're done here, if it's a little confusing, come back. I think a lot of dots will connect next time when we bring it all together. So that's the scope. Let's dig right in. In the first year of Darius, the son, and, I, and there's no endorsement of the interpretation of these names ever from me. Uh, Asuras, we'll say that. That's probably wrong. Of the Sid of Midias, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Can everybody in the back still hear me? Am I still good on decibels? Okay. Verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in desolation of Jerusalem. Okay? So we see here in verse 2 that this whole thing is coming about because Daniel is reading Jeremiah. We're going to look to that verse to see what he's seen. Okay? Um, I guess some background. Um, the 70 years. Does anybody recognize the 70 year captivity? Anybody aware of that? The, the Jews are in 70 year captivity because of their idolatry, their sin, and their lack of obedience to the Lord. And the Lord put them in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. 
Here is Daniel about 67 years into that 70 year period reading Jeremiah and we'll look at the verse in a minute and seeing that this 70 year period is about to come to an end. So Daniel is responding to what he sees as being read in Jeremiah. So let's just look at Jeremiah, the bunny trail real quick and see what he sees. Jeremiah 25 verse 11 and 12. And this whole land shall be desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and the nation. Set the Lord for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation. So we have, once 70 years are accomplished. What, are we, what can we conclude by looking at that verse right now uh, from what Daniel has seen? And I'll give you a hint, because you're like, what, what, what kind of a question is that? Um, is Daniel taking Jeremiah figuratively, or does it look like he's taking him literally? <laughs> Looks like he's taking him literally, right? <clears throat> Most of Christendom, in my view, and, and I'm going to try to explain this as we go, allegorizes the Bible far more than they should. Does the Bible use allegories and have allegories? Absolutely. Does that mean the Bible is an allegory? Absolutely not. And I think, I'm, I think, I think it's, it, it, assuming you come back and you like this, um, I think I'm going to show you, I, I hope that you get a sense of the integrity of the Word of God, the, the intricacy of the design of the Word of God, because when you discover that, it will change your life. It will change your life. Every number, every detail, every place name, even the mathematical structures behind the text are there by deliberate design. This is a book like no other, friends. Like no other. The word of the living God. Everything is there by deliberate design. You want a Bible verse for that? I don't have the exact reference, but it's in Matthew 5. Jesus says, not one yacht or one tittle shall pass till all be fulfilled. I won't get into that deeply, but a yacht or a tittle would be the equivalent of saying the crossing of a T or a dotting of the I. It is a call from the Lord Jesus Christ to take the text Seriously. Take the text seriously. Yes, the Bible, the Holy Spirit through the Bible uses figures of speech, similes, metaphors, hyperboles, puns, types. You can actually uh, list over 200 types of rhetorical devices the Holy Spirit uses. But God's call to you and I is to take the text seriously. And that's what we we're hoping to do here today. Take it seriously, learn the Word of God, hopefully draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, and equip each and every one of you to be able to minister as the Lord opens doors and, and as the Lord uses you to minister to people that might have questions about these things. If you're not an expert, that's fine. But um, hopefully you'll grow in knowledge, image, closeness, relationship with the Lord as we go through this. Note, notice here too in Jeremiah, the servitude of the nation is in view here. We're not just talking about the city, we're talking about the nation of Israel. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. After 70 years, we'll skip ahead a few chapters, Jeremiah 29.10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you to return to this place. So again, Daniel sees this. There's 67 years into the 70 years and says God's about to visit us. God's about to move. In fact, he gets a visitation here very soon. Okay. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So what's he do immediately when he recognizes the time's getting near? He's praying. He's humbling himself. He's repenting. We'll see for what. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Remember, the nation of Israel, how it went for the nation of Israel was very much conditional. Yes, God loves them unconditionally, but go back to Deuteronomy. If they were obedient, what happened? They were blessed. If they were disobedient, what happened? They were cursed. So go at the nation of Israel was based on their response to God and to their faithfulness. God loved them unconditionally throughout, but... I say unconditionally. But things as it went for the nation of Israel was based on their faithfulness. That's kind of foreign to the Christian that is operating in a period of grace that is still hard to put into words. That's still hard to put into words. But he's, he's repenting. He's going before the Lord. He's praying. 
We have sinned and committed iniquity. Notice in the Bible, uh, there's two people in the Old Testament where nothing evil is spoken of. Do you know who those two are in the Old Testament? Enoch. Enoch. Not, maybe Enoch. No. I thought, um, but, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to dig this out for yourself. I think it's Daniel and Joseph. Now, now, I know there's nothing evil spoken of of Daniel in the Bible. But yet it says here, we have sinned. And now, it, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Daniel was sinless. But the Bible doesn't record any of his sins. It has nothing evil spoken of Daniel. But yet he is repenting for whatever sins he might have, but he's also repenting for the sins of his nation. Mm -hmm. Are we doing that? Are we doing that? Are we crying out to the Lord for America? We should be. We should be praying for our nation. We should be repenting on the behalf of our nation. Our nation needs our prayers. And if the church of Jesus Christ is not going to stand up and tell the truth, tell the truth in love, not, not, not rudely, but if we're not going to tell the truth and be salt and light in this world, then who is? We need to stand in the gap for our nation, be praying for our leaders, be praying for the sins of our nation. Tens of thousands of babies by the end of next week will be killed in America before they're even born. This country needs our prayers. Okay. But he's repenting. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Prophet after prophet comes, right? Warning them, telling them what they need to do. They're rejected. Most of the prophets were killed. Okay? He's repenting for this. O oh Lord, righteousness belong unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Who? To the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel, we're talking about Israel here, that are near and that are far off, through all the countries which thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. Daniel says exactly why they're in captivity. He's not pulling punches. O Lord, to us belong confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. There it is, we have sinned against the Lord. To the Lord our God belong mercies, forgiveness, that we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws. Obedience is in view here. Behavior is in view here. Which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have tra transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured out upon us. What curse? Deuteronomy. They didn't obey. God, God told Moses what, that, that they would be cursed. It's spelled out in the Torah. According, well, it says that. I got ahead of myself. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Now, I do think there were saved in this remnants, but, but collectively, Israel the nation had sinned against the Lord. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges, that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done, and hath been done upon Jerusalem. And he goes on. As it is written in the law of Moses, again he's referencing Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayers before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Sixty-seven years, approximately, in captivity, in slavery, they still didn't draw him to repentance. It sounds like. Verse 14, Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. He's not pulling punches, friends. And now, O Lord God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. Interesting, he's referencing a prior deliverance. You know, sometimes we can be in the valley, guys, we can be almost out of hope. We can be desperate. We need to remember what the Lord has done for us in the past. Yes. And if you need to journal that to remember and reference and do it. But there's going to be times where I don't hear the word of the Lord. I don't feel his grace. I, you know, I'm in a valley. I'm going through a hard time. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you. And don't forget what the word of God says. It's so important. It's so important. So, so Daniel here, 67 years slavery. He goes back 
to, 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 to when God delivers them from Egypt. And what does he do? With a mighty right hand, God delivers them from Egypt. And how thou gotten thee renowned. As, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. And you're going to see as we continue to go here, it's almost like his prayer gets intense. You ever do that? You ever have private prayer? And as you get going, you get something happens, the spirit starts moving. I think I think we see that with Daniel. You be your own. You come to your own conclusions with that. Come to your own um, thoughts. Can I just share right along this line? You mentioned the abortion issue, and right after that last that last great late term to to infanticide actually abortion was you know and and it came on television. I was watching and the people hilarious that this had passed in New York. I think it was in Virginia. It was, and I'm just crying out that Daniel was here for the sins of our nation. And how God did he look yes. on us? And yes. right after that, the announcement that had occurred the month previously of our dedication of our embassy in Jerusalem came on the TV. Mm -hmm. And I just heard in my heart God say, I got yours in the pack, I got yours. Oh, and praise and the just, Lord. We need that encouragement these days that we, we can't slack up. But yeah, and, 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 and we need not be silent because I'm 38, and uh, when I was a young teenager, um, you know, even like the homosexual issue, if there was a lot of homosexuals, they weren't proud about it, they didn't wear it on their sleeve, they were usually closet, uh, that's not the case anymore. And if you pay attention to what's going on right now, there's an agenda to legalize pedophilia. Mm -hmm. yeah. You give a little here, a little leaven spoils the whole loaf. And we, we, you know, we heard Pastor Russ talk about it last time. We heard Pastor Tom talk about it today. Um, we don't compromise the Word of God. We don't compromise the Word of God. We stand on the truth of the Word of God, and we see what happens when you compromise. Now, we're not Bible beaters and pounding the Bible on people's heads, but we speak the truth in love, and we don't apologize for that. We don't apologize for that. If our God is the God of truth, we need to be the people of truth. Amen? Amen. Okay? So thank you. Verse 17, Now therefore, O God, hear the prayers of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thy ear, and hear, open thine eyes, and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. Whose city is Jerusalem? God's city. Amen. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. How many people here have been justified by the Lord Jesus Christ because of something you did? None. Nothing you have done has saved you. And the same thing Daniel says here is true of this time. We are, don't do this because we're worthy. Don't do this because we're righteous. No, no, no. Do it because of your great love, because of your great grace, and because of your great mercy. So there's not a person here saved by the Lord Jesus Christ that isn't saved because they're worthy of it. We're saved because of the love of God. We're saved because of the grace of God. We're saved because of the mercies of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. What a great God. If it was up to us, we're in big trouble. Right. We are in big trouble if it's up to us. Okay? 19, oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Am I, am I really speaking as you would in an exclamation point? Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. He's getting intense here, right? Hearken and do, defer not thine own sake, oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So he's, that, he, so he's getting intense. He's getting excited. Verse 20. Enters Gabriel. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sin of my people Israel, there's your reference. He is a sinner. By his own testimony, he's confessing his sins and the sins of his people and presenting my supplication before the Lord. What's supplication? Requests. 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 Typically for others, right? Supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Ye, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, remember, he's had some visions before this time, 
being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So Gabriel. So Gabriel's one of these archangel guys, one of these super angels. We really only know of three of them by name. There are some references of other, Raphael and other. We won't beat that uh, tonight. But we've got Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. Uh, who's Michael? Anybody know? So Michael's an archangel. What's his role in the Bible, typically? What do we see him doing? He's the warrior. He's the captain of the Lord's host. And he's always defending and fighting on behalf of God's people. We see time and time through the scripture. Gabriel, every time he appears, it always seems that he's announcing something about the Messiah. It's almost as if he's Jesus Christ's press secretary. But he's always on the mission announcing messianic things. Who's Lucifer? <laughs> Bright and shining star. Yeah. What was he known for in heaven? The worship leader. The worship leader. You know, we need to remember that too, guys, because if he was the worship leader, obviously he knows something about that, and he can corrupt worship. And um, we need to be. We need to take our worship seriously. Um, when we go in before the Lord, we are pouring out our heart to the Lord. And I'm not going to lecture on worship. There's more qualified people to do that. Uh, but we need to take worship before the Lord seriously. How fun was it to sing holy, holy, holy? Amen. There is only one that's holy, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Holy is the Lord. So I want to bring something else, too, before we move on. The evening oblation. What in the world is that? Anybody? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. It's the last sacrifice of the day, right? With question, were there any sacrifices going on right now? No. No. When Daniel was saying this, he's in Persia. The temple was about 400 miles to the west, and it's in complete rubble. There is no temple. There is no evening oblation going on. It's what you would call an anachronism. But in Daniel's mind, interesting enough, there was still very much a reality. And I just share that with you because I think that just says something about the heart of Daniel. You know, even that story Pastor Tom said about the guy in jail. Mm. What you, I love, can I quote you, Daryl? What you focus on, you magnify. Mm -hmm. And I love the stories of people that in, in the deepest of valleys, in the hardest of times, are focusing on Jesus Christ. They have their eyes set on the Lord. What a lesson. It's hard for us because, I'll be honest with you guys, in America, we've had a mountaintop experience pretty much my whole life. I mean, valleys compared to what testimonies I hear, um, we're, we've been blessed. We've been blessed. The evening oblation. Uh, by the way, the word man here, Gabriel the man, uh, it's ish. It can mean man or servant, so don't get hung up on that uh, English translation there. Uh, Gabriel's always on the messianic announcements. We talked about that. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. You know, maybe we should be praying for that. Spiritual, biblical skill and understanding. I'm sure Daniel was very excited to hear that. Can you imagine Gabriel coming and saying, I'm going to give you skill and understanding. So something big is going on here. This is, this is Jesus' press secretary, an encounter with Daniel, and he's about to tell him something big. So we need to pay attention to that. Remember, what, what did Jesus say in Matthew 24? It wasn't just for pastors, right? Whosoever heareth it, let him understand so we want to understand what's going on here. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I come to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Okay? We can skip through this pretty quick, but at the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I came. And I, so, so the moment Daniel started praying, Gabriel was dispatched. But it took till verse 20 for him to get there. And I think that's important for you and I. How many of us have been desperate, went before the Lord and prayed, and didn't see anything happen? Gabriel isn't the small fish in the pan when it comes to angels. This is a big guy. And, he, and maybe he had some, some spiritual warfare. It doesn't say. I'm speculating. But he didn't come right away. So if you're in the valley, if you're 67 years in prison, 67 years in slavery and you're praying to the Lord and he's not answering right and right away don't give up hope 
You cling to your faith. God might right then and there be dispatching angels on your behalf. Keep praying. Keep seeking. Some of you are praying for healing for loved ones. Emotional healing. Physical healing. Don't lose heart. I'm not here to give you a formula on how to get it done. But don't lose heart. What's unseen, the Bible says, Paul says, what's unseen is more real than what is seen. There is a warfare going on in the heavenlies. And we don't see it and we don't really know what's going on. Don't lose heart. You cling to your faith. You cling to Jesus Christ. You might have been praying for somebody for 20, 30 years and they haven't gotten that provision. You hang on to your faith. You hang on to your faith. Read 1 Corinthians 15. How many people that accept the Lord Jesus Christ is going to live forever with a glorified body with him? All of them. 100%. 100%. It may be delayed, but it's not denied. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. Where are we at? <laughs> um, I'm going to skip. I have something here. We'll skip it. Um, it was brief, not a big deal. So let's get to why we're here, as we've been here an hour, right? Finally, that's David Albrecht. People that have been to an Albrecht class, that's, we're doing exactly what we do, right? Um, uh, but I appreciate your patience. Um, so that brings us to the 70th week prophecy. The little girl, right, Kim? I'm saying this is so great. Even all the stuff you've been sharing, this is good. This is oh, okay. yeah. I hope you're being blessed. Amen. This is right along because we're not interjecting. Yes, amen. <laughs> by the way, that's by design. We would never finish if this was open. For you. We would never finish. So the 70th week prophecy of Daniel. What is this all about? We need to understand that. Foundational background before we read one word in the book of Revelation. Okay. So here's the outline. We're going to get the scope of this entire prophecy in Daniel 9.24. We're going to get the 69 weeks of the 70th weeks. It's going to make more sense. It's confusing if you've never heard it before. But we're getting a part of it in Daniel 9.25. We're going to see that there's an interval. Very clearly, there are things that happen in these 69 weeks. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a hint. 69 weeks of years that occur before the... the um, the 70th week and also after the 69 week, if that makes sense. Did I say that right? There are things that happen after the 69 weeks but before the 70th week. So there's things that happen. There's a pause or an interval. interval. We're going to see that very clearly. That'll be next time. So you need to come back or this is just going to be a big waste of time for you. Uh, and then we'll have Daniel 9.27, which is the 70th week. Okay. So that is the scope. That's why we're here tonight. Okay. So let's just jump right in. Daniel 9.24. If, you know, you could debate it. I think Daniel 9 is the most important chapter in the entire Bible. It doesn't mean I'm right. But uh, if you lost John chapter 3, you, you'd still find out that God loved you. You know. Uh, but, um, but this is some pretty important stuff. So verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So this is the scope of the prophecy. Seventy weeks. Let's talk about weeks. Um, what's a week to you and I? Seven days. Seven days. Okay. Um... In the Bible, in fact, I'm getting ahead of myself. I won't do that, but I'll show you when we get to the slides. In the Bible, you can have weeks of days. That's pretty obvious because of creation, seven days. Uh, he creates six days, seventh day he rests. Uh, but th there will be weeks of weeks, you'll find, that are in the Bible. There's a week of months in the Bible. By the way, the week of weeks is the Feast of Weeks. Uh, but there's a week of years as well, sabbatical year. Um, six years, you attend the, the earth. Till the earth. The seventh year would be off, right? And then there's a special one at the seventh one. What's that called? After seven times, seven sabbatical years, Jubilee. it's Jubilee. 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 Yeah, okay. So we won't have to spend a ton, ton of time on that. So there's 70 weeks. So the word there implies seven. Okay, so, so let, me, let me interpret this a different way. Weeks, the word there, I'm not going to pronounce that word, it means sevens. So read 24 a different way. There are 70 sevens. 
So if it's 77 either days, weeks, months, or years, or something else. Forget about the something else, it's not something else, okay? I already gave you the hint, we're talking about years, but let me make my point. Um, so we've got a, a mathematical prophecy, 77s, who's it on? Who, who are we talking about? It's in bold on the screen. Upon who? Thy people and upon thy holy city. Are we talking about the church? No. We are not talking about the church. We are talking about Israel. And then he gives six things. So it's upon thy people. He's talking about the Jews, not the church or the Gentile world. But he gives six things here. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision, and to anoint the most holy place. The most holy place is what? The holy of holies. The most holy place. He's talking about the holy of holies. So a question to the group. I'm going to take a drink and pause. Have these been fulfilled? Very important question before we move on. We might be able to argue that some have, right? Um, does anybody think that all of these have been fulfilled today as we stand here? Has there been an end of sin? Not so you'd notice, right? 2020, if there was ever a reminder that we still got sin, we got sin. So we've got a mathematical prophecy, and we can very quickly conclude, right, that these six things haven't yet happened. So we're somewhere in the middle of this mathematical prophecy that Daniel is talking about. Can we all, are you with me so far? Can we, can we make that assumption? Okay? We're somewhere in there. So we've got 77s. Okay? And he's going to go on. So that's the scope. These six things are going to happen over this mathematical prophecy. If it's confusing, stay with me. It, 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 you haven't heard the whole thing yet. And it might be confusing until we finish next session. So I said, we have days. Uh, we, we viewed weeks as seven days, right? There is a feast of weeks. You'll find that in Leviticus 23. So there's a week of weeks. There's a week of months. It goes from Nishon to Tishri, or from Tishri to Nisan, either way you want to go. But there's a feast of, uh, but there's a there's a week of months, Exodus 12, Leviticus 23, and there's also a week of years. And we've, and we've talked about this already, so I won't beat that to death. Uh, but we've got weeks of years, and I'm going to suggest to you that the years are in view here. So 77 implies weeks of years, and I'm not going to take the time. We're we're, we're already getting late here. Um, but you can reference Genesis 29. But I'm going to suggest to you that we have years in, involved here. So if we have 70 groups of 7, what's 70 times 7? Did the math for you if you were looking, right? 490 years. So I'm going to suggest to you that we have a prophecy dealing with 490 years. We don't know when it starts yet. We know very little. We just know that we've got a prophecy in these six things that he said in, in, in verse 24. Excuse me are going to be fulfilled, okay? Um, the next verse is going to deal with 69 of the, of the 70 weeks of years. So does that make sense? So set one is seven, set two is seven, set three is seven, right? Up to 70 sets. That's where we get the 490, okay? So verse 25 Let's look at this. This is 69 of the 70 weeks. This is the, this is the meat of tonight's session. Know therefore and understand. What's he say? Know, know, know therefore and understand. understand. I think that's for all of us, not just for Daniel. Because again, Jesus says, whoever hears, let him understand in Matthew 24. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the King, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troubled times. So let me do you a favor. Threescore. We're reading, all my commentaries are in the King James. Let's read it in the New King James, or, or pick a translation. Therefore shall be seven, this is out of the New King James, the first bullet. There shall be seven weeks and six two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. So let's, let's take out the three score and try to make more sense of that. So you have there 
7 plus 62. Or if you want to read it differently, it's still a little confusing in the English, 7 plus 60 plus 2. Either way, you get 69. Okay, what's in view here, and it's very clear when you dig through the English translations, the original text, 69 of these 70 weeks of years are in view here. So he says, Gabriel tells Daniel that in four, what's the math on that? 69 times 7 is what? 483. 483 of the 490 years, we've got something going on. He says, so know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the King shall be 70 weeks of 69 weeks of 7 years or 483 years. So what does that tell us? Well, not a whole lot if we don't know when the commandment was to restore and to build Jerusalem. <coughs> If we, if we can determine that, we've got our start date, right? <coughs> the other thing we need to know is, if it, we know it's happened, we're Christians, right? Jesus presented himself as Messiah and was killed for it, right? So I think if you're following me here, you can see that 69 of these 70 weeks are behind us. We've got one week of seven years that's still in front of us. But we'll make that more clear through the rest of this session and next session as we go. But we need to know when was the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. That's number one. So let's just start there. Okay. There's your math. I should have put the bullet down before I asked you that question. I'm not trying to stump anybody here. So what the question is, when was the commandment given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? Not when it was built. Take the text seriously. The commandment to build it. When was the decree or the commandment given to build it? So if we're diagramming this, we have four, it's going to be tough to read, I'm sorry about that to those in the back, but we have a start point, the commandment to restore Jerusalem, and we have an end point, the Messiah the King. That's 483 years of mathematical prophecy, okay? And so we need to know when the commandment was made. So in the Bible, there are actually four major dates in view here. I'll give you a hint which one's the right one. Does anybody know? The, one, maybe. the fourth one? The one that's in bold, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> but test it. Don't believe David Albrecht. Test it for yourself. But there's three major dates, actually four major dates we need to look at here. And I guess before I go any further, I need to explain something. So uh, we have the first three that are Ezra, and then the last one, which we're going to suggest is in view here, is from Nehemiah. So the book of Ezra is the chronicle of Cyrus freeing them to go home and rebuild the temple. And I'm going to emphasize temple. Okay? When you go through Ezra, everything is in, re is in regards to the temple. And you're going to find when you read Ezra, they try to rebuild this te temple, and they have a lot of problems because they're getting attacked. And I'll let you do, read it for yourself and, 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 and figure that out. But they have a lot of problems because the city is in ruins. There's no walls. There's no defenses. Uh, they've got a problem. So that leads to the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah is, a, is the, uh, uh, the cupbearer to Artaxerxes. Uh, and through Nehemiah, Nehemiah finds favor with Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes and through his dealings, ultimately... Uh, Nehemiah gets Artaxerxes to issue a decree in 445 B.C. to rebuild the city. Out of the four in view here, the only one that deals with the city is Nehemiah, 445 B.C. I'm going to go back real quick here. It says, restore and to build Jerusalem. And if there was any doubt that they're talking about the city, what does the Holy Spirit say at the bottom? And the street shall be built again, and the law even in troubled times. It's not just dealing with the temple. Very clearly, the entire city is in view here. Okay? So the decree of, of 445 B.C. is the only one that deals with the city, and is the one that is in view here concerning this prophecy. So I'm going to suggest to you, David Albrecht, David Albrecht knows nothing. Okay? Um, these are discoveries by the grace of the Holy Spirit. A lot of this is outlined uh, the Coming Prince, Sir Robert Anderson. Uh, any diligent student, uh, order this. You can get it on Amazon or a bookstore. Uh, he really goes through and details a lot of this. I'm trying to give credit where credit's due, um, but the credit is not mine. It's the Lord's and many other people much smarter than I am. Um, so, David, what book was that again? It's called The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. Oh, I have that. Okay, all right, yeah. 
Well, then I need to get with you and find out what else you have in your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So, so, so history actually records it. We got the date, March 14, 445 BC, and uh, that's according to Sir Robert Anderson. I'll let you guys fact check that and dig that out on your own, but it does seem to check out uh, from everything that I've seen. Oops, again. So, turns out, when you look at Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, Revelation's future, right? From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible always deals in 360-day years. Okay, it might be a little confusing. But Genesis it does, and I've referenced it on the slides. I'm not going to take the time to go through it. Sir Robert Anderson does, by the way. And uh, so from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible deals in 360-day years. So if we're going to start doing a mathematical calculation, we better be on the scale of the Bible, right? So if we're using our scale, we've got problems. Um, so ancient calendars, by the way, all ancient calendars that I've found were based on 360-day years as well. And I've listed those, we won't go through them, but all of them are based on 360-day years. Usually it was 12, 30-day months, not always, but most of the time. So it turns out that's the case. So anciently speaking, 360-day years. Turns out, and I'm not going to bunny trail, we got to get you out, try to get you out of here in 20 minutes. But it turns out in 701 BC, we had a long day of Joshua and something happened. There's conjectures. Uh, I'm not going to, oh, I have to resist the urge. <laughs> so I am, I'm going to resist the urge. But there are conjectures as to what happened. You can explore that out on your own. But let's just say something happened in relation to the long day of Joshua. And it appears at about that time, 701 BC, we had a change. So something happened with orbits and other things, and we'll leave that for you to speculate. I don't think that there's any concrete answer to that, but there are some good speculations. But, but, we, but the point is we're dealing with 360-day years, okay? So if we're starting at March 14, 445 BC, and we're dealing with 360-day years, I'll save you the trouble and do the math. That's 173,880 days. If we want to be the extremist in the room and say that this, it, we're just going to take this incredibly literal and say that, well, maybe to the very day. And do we have to do that? Well, maybe it's just the year. Maybe it's about that time. But, um, but, but, but let's just try to be extremist and take it to the very day. What is that very day? Remember the second part of the prophecy? It starts with the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. What's the way? He would slip away. But then at one point, he does something weird. Not only does he permit it, but when you study the scripture carefully, he arranges it. Right? We know this is the triumphal entry, right? Mm -hmm. He arranges it. He deliberately sets things up to fulfill prophecy of Zechariah and also Psalm 118. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. That's when he comes. The coming of the Messiah, the king. The Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the king. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So Jesus here, and I won't go through, we're running out of time, but Jesus deliberately, when you study this, tells his disciples, go to a certain place, give them a password, they're going to release a donkey to you, bring the donkey, and he ends up riding it into Jerusalem, fulfilling this verse. I mean, this wasn't by accident. Jesus arranges this. It is right here that I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus is presenting himself as king to his people. And I'm going to give you more evidence of that as we go. Um, how many people have heard, and this is from Psalm 118, how many people have heard, this is the day the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it? Yeah. How many of you have attributed it to every day? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good, that's great. But it's actually speaking of a specific day. It's speaking of the triumphal entry of the Lord. Okay? Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This was a day that Jesus Christ arranged. Um, so this is the day that I'm going to suggest to you that's in view here. Uh, the triumphal entry is in Luke 19. Luke 19.38 says, Saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
That's a quote from Psalm 118. The emphasis here is on the king. In Luke 19, Jesus Christ is presenting himself as the Messiah, the king to his people, where in other times, he specifically avoided it. He specifically avoided it, saying, what? My hour had not yet come. He's, Daniel 9 is in view here. This mathematical prophecy is in view here. There was a specific time that he would present himself as the king. Okay? So, we know that Christ's ministry began in the fall of A.D. 28. How do you know that, David? Well, the Bible says Tiberius was appointed in A.D. 14, and we know that Augustine died on August 19th of A.D. 14. We know that from Luke 3, 1, that Jesus' ministry began in the 15th year of Tiberius. For those that are nerdy, dig it out. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. But if you're in the 15th year, then the 15th year hasn't fully passed yet or been completed yet, which means you're in the 14th year. So when you do the simple math, the simple math is we're starting in A.D. 14. We're adding 14 years. That gets us what? A.D. 28. So his ministry begins in A.D. 28. By the way, the primary resource to fact check that is in his book, Sir Robert Anderson, The Coming Prince. Phenomenal work. Phenomenal work he did over 100 years ago. That's uh, amazing. Okay. Now you will find, uh, and part of in that book, you're going to find a chronology. And, and, and if you really study chronologies, you're going to see that there's lots of different chronologies. Most of uh, the chronologies, you're going to find a common problem and it's usually tied to them trying to connect the Passover or the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on a Friday. Anybody that has Jesus Christ dying on a Friday usually ends up in some regard, when you really dig into it, I'm not going to bore you with that, but they have problems with um, uh, their chronology because they have Christ dying on Friday. So I guess I'll ask the group. Does anybody have a problem if Christ dies on another day besides Friday? <laughs> Is Friday set in stone here? How many of you guys are familiar with the prophecy of Jonah? Right? Jesus, so let me read to you. It's in Matthew 12. But he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. He goes on. What does that mean? Well, he tells you. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What did he say? Three days and three nights. Do we know when, what day of the week Jesus was resurrected? He's the Feast of First Fruits. When was he resurrected? Sunday. He was resurrected on Sunday. That we know. Okay? So if, he's so if he's dead on Friday and resurrected on Sunday, let's do the math. Let, he was killed near the end of Friday, right? Friday day is what we'll call it. So Friday day, so let's start with Saturday. Saturday day is day one. Saturday night is night one. Sunday day is day two. Whoops. Got a problem, right? Got a big problem. Was he, was, did he die? And, was he dead and resurrected according to the prophet Jonah? I think he was, because I think God says what he means and means what he says. Mm -hmm. Sir Robert Anderson's chronology has him dying on a Wednesday, has Passover that year on a Wednesday. Let's do that math. So if, if we don't count Wednesday, Thursday day is one, Thursday night is one, Friday day is two, Friday night is two, Saturday day is three, Saturday night is is night three. Three days, three nights. Not three nights and three days, three days and three nights. Let's take it for what it says, right? So Wednesday seems to fit. That happens to be uh, how uh, Sir Robert Anderson has it outlined. Some argue that it's Thursday. If you want to count Thursday as the day, uh, day one, uh, then, then it fits. But most of the day had gone past. I won't split hairs. But it's Wednesday fits for me. I don't have a problem with that. I got a big problem with a Friday crucifixion. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. it just doesn't fit. So, but he was he was likely killed on a Wednesday. Sir Robert Anderson's uh, and, and does some some amazing work on that. Uh, we've got like three slides left, so we're close. Ten minutes. We, we shoot for twelve, and I think we might get there. 
So what, why do I say all that? So that means that the fourth Passover, ask if it's Gabriel. <laughs> so, so that means that the fourth Passover of Jesus' ministry would be on April 6th of 32 AD. Again, this is all in Sir Robert Anderson's book. So we have the starting date. We have the end date. 173,880 days. Question. You don't need to know the answer. What was Gabriel's margin of error according to the chronology of Sir Robert Anderson? How many days was he off? Zero. Zero. To the very day that Gabriel told Daniel Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would present himself, he did. Should that surprise us? Mm. Not really. Not if we take the, the text seriously, right? Mm -hmm. and that, and, you know, you come here long enough, I'm, you're gonna, I'll say something to offend everybody. <laughs> but um, the, the Catholic Church ha is uh, amillennial, meaning they, they allegorize the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I won't pick on the Catholic Church solely. Most denominational churches are amillennial that allegorize the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, he comes in our hearts, or, uh, you know, that they don't take it seriously, that he's seriously coming back. Daniel took Jeremiah seriously. He took him literally. Um, when we find out that when we take Daniel literally, there's some amazing discoveries when we do, when we take him literally to the very day Jesus came, just as Gabriel said he would. And it's interesting, Jesus knew that. He knew that. He knew that he, he, couldn't be, he couldn't be presented as king. He couldn't allow himself to be presented as king. When he was presented as king, he was fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, and the people around him were singing Psalm 118. Now to you or I as a Gentile, that doesn't make any sense, but to the Pharisees that know Jeremiah or uh, Zechariah 9.9 and Psalm 118, they're saying, this guy is claiming to be God. And what does he say? He says, Master, rebuke your disciples. They're blaspheming. What does he say? What does Jesus say? Surely if they would be silent, the very rocks would cry out. This is the day what the Lord has made. Jesus made that day and arranged that day. Praise God. And I've never been to Israel. Has anybody ever been to Israel? Does anybody plan to go to Israel? If you plan to go to Israel, when you're on your tour... Go to the triumphal entry place and do me a favor. Pick up some rocks. <laughs> and I'm serious. If you think of me, pick up some rocks and bring them back because I want to put them in a glass case. I want to put them in my living room and I want to invite as many friends and people as I can over and they're going to say, why do you have rocks set up in your living room? And I'm going to say, those are the rocks that didn't cry out. Let me tell you about it. Amen. Pastor Tom is taking a trip. Setting up a trip next August or next April, end of April. So there's a path. Lots of people do it. Yeah. I got one for you. Those are the rocks that didn't cry out. Make the rocks cry out, but if you drop a rock, it'll make you cry out. <laughs> Amen. His margin of error was zero. Well, let's wrap this up. We're getting close. I'm back in Luke 19. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou at least in thy day, this day, this thy day, Jesus is speaking, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes. Does that make you want to almost cry? What's he saying? For the days shall come upon thee, and thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Why? Why? Why, God? What's he talking about? He's talking about the destruction of the city, right? We know that as the diaspora, 70 AD. It's recorded in history, very well recorded. Rome encompasses the city and destroys it. The temple is destroyed. There hasn't, been, hasn't been a temple there since. Why? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And I've got to tell you guys, that scares me. 
Is what we just talked about today trivial? No. If you just casually read your Bible, would you connect all those dots? I wouldn't. <laughs> this is the work of a lot of people more brilliant than I am. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. It appears to me that Jesus expected them to know. And yes, it was prophesied, don't get me wrong, but he expected them to know. And you wouldn't have known this being someone that goes to church once a month who never reads their Bible, who never studies. The Pharisees should have known. Well, they, they did know, they just didn't accept him, right? Yeah, right. Listen, he's presenting himself as the king, the Messiah. But that, is a, that scares me because I have to ask myself this question. What am I missing? What am I missing? What are we missing? What's in the text that we haven't discovered? What might we get to heaven and Jesus expect us to know that we didn't know? It's a call from, and it's not to scare anybody, but it's a call. I think it's a call to all of us to take the text seriously. God means what he says. He says what he means. It's also a call, to, I think, to understand prophecy. And you know what? If, if you would have given me my choice, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, this is my, really, I mean, I've done a few minor projects. This is my first major undertaking with PowerPoint, and an army of people came in here to hear this. And this isn't easy stuff to teach, guys. And if this was my choice, I wouldn't do it. I, Anita and I are doing this because the Lord asked us to. And I hope it blesses you. Uh, this is not easy stuff. But I think the Lord's going to bless us as we go along. I hope you'll come back, um, and I hope you'll be blessed by it. I think there's going to be some great discoveries as we go. David, I'm going to ask you, when does the 70 weeks begin? When do they actually begin? That's a great question. The 70th week is next session. <laughs> There's your carrot. <laughs> that leads me to my second to the last side. Next session. We, so we've covered half of this. We have a mathematical prophecy. Uh, we're going to talk about this interval. There, we're going to find out that there's an interval where things happen after these 69 weeks and before the 70 weeks, and we're going to break that down. Then we're going to talk about the 70th week of prophecy. That 70th week, that's the million-dollar question, though, because that's what the world is asking, guys. Is this the time of the end? Is Jesus about to come back? What does that look like? Is there a rapture before this happens? Is there a rapture after? Is the rapture something made up? You know, let's see what the Bible says. Let's take it seriously. Jesus told the, pointed the disciples to Daniel. Daniel took Jeremiah seriously. Daniel took Gabriel seriously. We're coming to find that there's been blessings if we take the Word of God seriously. Let's find out what the Word of God says. Not what... What David Albrecht says, or Tom Canaan, you know David Albrecht and Tom Canaan aren't 100% in alignment on eschatology, and that's okay. Don't worry about it. We're probably both wrong in some regards. What does the Bible say? Let's, do, let's be a diligent student and come, invite the Holy Spirit to come and show us what the Bible says about these things. But that's the million-dollar question of our day. When does the 70th week start? It's the most documented period of time in the entire Bible. There is more about that that seven week period, that seven week of years, that seven year period of time. There's more in the Bible of that period of time than when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and climbed the mountains of Judea. Believe that? It's true. There's more in the Bible about this seven year period of time. And if it's at, if it's if it's short, if it's quickly approaching or soon to be approaching, we need we need to talk about it, guys. We need to find out what the Word of God says about it. We do. So we're going to talk about that next time. You have to come back because that's another session in and of itself. The 70th week, Daniel 9, 27. From Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation 19, 11, I might be wrong, when Jesus returns, that seven-year period is outlined. That's why we have to look here first, get the foundation, get the background before we get started. So, you know, it doesn't look like a partner ministry, so I am done. Would you please come up and pray for us and maybe take some questions? Uh, after prayer... Um, a couple quick things. After prayer, if you've got to go, go. If you want to stick around and ask some questions, ask some questions. Here's something else to consider. Um, if you have some questions, you can ask them, that's fine. But consider writing them down. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about yet. You might find that God will answer your questions for you. I would encourage you, if you have questions as, you, as we're going along, write them down and see what the Lord does. Take it to prayer. Maybe through these teachings and through these discussions, the Lord will answer them for you. 
When's the 70th week? We'll talk about that next time. But, um, but see what the Lord does. I think he's going to show himself mighty. And I think we both can attest that we believe the Lord's going to do something big with this study. Because even coming up to this, we felt the opposition of Satan. Satan does not want us talking about this. I can tell you that right now. And um, so, so I think the Lord's going to do big things. We're just going to be faithful again. We're just um, his people trying to do, use our gifts and do what he's called us to do. And so that's what we're going to do. So would you please pray for us and close us out? And... Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just are such privileged people to know that you want to speak to us, that you want us to study your word, and that you want us to understand because your Holy Spirit teaches us. And so we're so grateful. We're so thankful that you love us that much. Not only love us enough to die for us, but that you want to speak to our hearts and show us those great and mighty things that we do not know. Father, I know that there are many needs in this, in this room, Lord God, that everyone came, some, not everyone came with a joyful heart like, like Pastor Russ said, but maybe we're having issues and we're, and we're agonizing over the stress that is in this country right now, Father God. So we look to you, O oh Lord, to meet our every need, to show us, to take control of this country and do your will, O oh Lord, because that is the best and that you meet our needs and you hold us in your righteous right hand and we are the sheep of your pasture. So, Lord, meet the needs of the people. Where encouragement is needed, give encouragement. Father, where healing is needed, touch that body and heal, O oh Lord. Where spirits needed to be lifted, Father, lift us. Show us your beautiful face and help us to see your hand at work in our lives every moment of the day. And Lord, as we leave this room, send us out into that world that is dying, that has their eyes closed, their, the scales are on their eyes, Lord. And help us to speak Jesus into every conversation that the scales might fall off, Lord, because that's what we want to be. We want to be those fishers of men, Lord, like you said, your disciples. Help us to bring many into your fold, O oh Lord, and you lead us in those paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Then bring us back next week, O oh Lord my God, in love with you and in excitement in our heart for your holy word. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer anything. If not, you're free to go. <laughs> <laughs>